A woman melted into a couch when her parents neglected her for 12 years. This case literally gave me the chills. So what happened? On the 3rd of January, 2022, Lacey Fletcher was found naked and deceased on her parents' couch in Louisiana. She was left there by her parents who claimed all she wanted to do was sit there. You see, Lacey had been sick. She had a whole host of medical issues which immobilized her and her parents were meant to be taking care of her. Police found her, she'd been sitting on that couch for over 12 years. Her skin had melted into the fabric and it created a sort of hole, which you can see here. She was also covered in urine, feces, and maggots. She had severe ulcers all over her body. Her parents basically let her sit in a pile of human filth. Even more disturbing was the fact that Lacey was extremely skinny when they found her. It was almost like she had been starved. And in the autopsy, they discovered foam from the couch in her stomach, which means she had been so hungry, she had tried to eat that couch. There's no doubt that Lacey died from severe neglect. Interestingly enough, her parents, Sheila and Clay Fletcher, they were considered pillars in their community and they were described by their neighbors as nice church going people. They had no idea what they were hiding in their house. Both Lacey's parents were arrested and charged. To hear more sinful deeds from real life people, hit the plus button. Here's a face that's been all over the news lately. Usually, you'd see a photo like this with the title murder trial and assume that they're the victim, but not in this case. 32-year-old Lucy Letby has been charged with taking the lives of seven babies and attempting to take ten more. She was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital from June 2015 to June 2016, and this was the time span in which these infants passed away. She was finally removed from the neonatal unit after a senior doctor realized that she was the only common denominator for all of these children. Lucy Letby has pleaded not guilty on all accounts. So her defense team have said that it's just a coincidence that she was present at the passing of every child. They've also said that the passings were natural and not caused by any human interference. The prosecution, however, have presented evidence stating that the victims' lives were deliberately taken, mainly by injecting air into their circulation. Police also supposedly recovered some major evidence from her home after her arrest in 2018. The evidence was a handwritten note, with one section of it reading the following. I unalived them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them. Well, I guess... Take from that what you will. This teen took revenge on his ex in the most horrific way. On June 3rd, 17-year-old Madison Schmitz was stabbed by her ex-boyfriend, 18-year-old Spencer Pearson, outside a restaurant in Jacksonville. On this day, Madison, her mother Jackie, and a friend were sitting at a restaurant named Mr. Chubby's Wings when they noticed Spencer sitting at a table not too far from them. You see, Madison and Spencer had been broken up for a couple of months now, but he has been harassing her by following her to school and leaving notes on her car. So when they spotted Spencer, sitting close to them at the restaurant, they quickly left. Spencer followed Madison and her mother to the parking lot. He threw Madison to the ground and began stabbing her. Madison was stabbed 15 times. Many of these wounds hit her back, which caused her to be paralyzed. Madison's mother was also stabbed in the head and leg while she tried to protect her daughter. This man who happened to be there intervened and tried to stop Spencer, and as a result, he was stabbed in the hand. When police were on their way, Spencer slit his throat in an attempt to take his own life, but he was unsuccessful. Spencer has been charged with two counts of attempted premeditated murder and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. This is why we should be careful on dating apps. This is 28 year old Nadine Aburras and she was from the UK. In 2012, Nadine decided that she wanted to join a dating website and she made a profile on MuslimMatch.com. On this website, she met Sami Almahari and he was posing as a millionaire from the United States. The relationship grew quickly and became very intense. Since Nadine was in the UK and Sammy was in the United States, they started a long distance relationship and they would be seen talking on the phone for hours until the early morning. In 2013, they ended up meeting for the first time and later on Nadine realized that he was lying about his occupation and he wasn't actually a millionaire, he was a taxi driver. Yes, Nadine was upset with Sammy, and it wasn't the fact that he wasn't a millionaire, it was the fact that he lied to her all this time. 
Unfortunately, the relationship quickly became abusive and Sammy would leave Nadine covered in bruises. On December 30th of 2014, Sammy had visited Nadine in Cardiff, UK. He went to Nadine's home but got into an altercation with her brother, so he was asked to leave. Sammy was staying at a hotel pretty close by to Nadine's home, so that's when he gave her a call and told her that he had actually left his passport at her home and if she could bring it to him. They ended up going to a nearby restaurant and around 11 p.m. is when they made it back to the hotel. An hour later, Sammy was seen at a casino with some fresh scratches to his face. Sammy then took Nadine's car to the airport and he took a flight to Qatar. The next day around 12.20 p.m. was New Year's Eve and Nadine's body was found in that hotel room. Police had discovered that Nadine's laptop and phone were missing, so that could only mean that Sammy had these. Soon enough, Nadine's family were getting text messages from her phone and this was Sammy. He was just taunting them and basically telling them that they were going to be next. On January 19th, 2015, Sammy was located in Tanzania. He was arrested and brought back to the UK. Sammy claimed he was suffering from abnormality of mental function and that the voice of God told him to kill Nadine. In 2016, Sammy was given a life in prison with a minimum term of 17 years before being eligible for parole. This is one of the hardest cases that we've ever had to cover, is the case of Junko Furuta. She was in high school in Japan and she was abducted and she was tortured for 40 days. She was held captive by these four men and they did unspeakable things to her of abuse and torture. She was very beautiful and she had her whole life in front of her. And the tragic way that she was abused, tortured and died sends chills down my spine. If you want to hear about this case, follow us the World's True Crime Podcast. This man allegedly sexually assaulted his own daughter and murdered his own son, and he's literally getting away with it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Solomon family. This is just my concise recap of the case. Click the comment if you want to see a longer version. But there is a time crunch to this story. Grant and Gracie Solomon were born to Angie and Aaron Solomon. They lived in the Franklin, Tennessee area. Aaron Solomon was a former news anchor in Nashville, Tennessee. Aaron's also a piece of crap. He emotionally, physically, and sexually abused all three members of his family. Domestic abuse calls were made to the house often. In 2013, Aaron and Angie were going through a divorce. But Aaron here, he decided to basically kidnap both kids and take them across state lines to North Carolina. When he did that, when Gracie was about 11 years old, he sexually assaulted her in their hotel room. She has proof there was a sexual assault kit, but the authorities are doing nothing about it. Both kids attended Grace Christian Academy School. It's part of Grace Christian Church there in Tennessee. Both of them tried telling the school about the abuse, but the school was like, no, we're going to ignore it. And the church ignored it too. So Grant's plan, when he turned 18, he was going to go to the authorities and tell them everything. It's believed he told his father Aaron that he was planning to do that. On July 20th, 2020, Aaron Solomon calls police to say that his son is pinned underneath a truck. The truck has somehow rolled down this hill and dragged Grant down the hill with him. When he called 911, he said there were three people there helping him, but when EMS arrived, there were no three people there. And all the witnesses said those three people were never there. So Aaron lied. The only significant injuries that Grant had to his body were to the back of his head where he had blunt force trauma. There was a bloody rock next to the truck. His glasses were placed neatly on the grass. The truck was piping hot because they had just driven an hour, but there were no burn marks, no drag marks to Grant's body, no grass stains on the clothing. His body was also in the opposite direction that it should have been. Aaron said he was pinned underneath the truck, but he wasn't. He was just lying in between the front tires. Even an untrained person can say, yeah, this was a staged scene. This was probably a murder. Franklin PD, however, no, it was an accident, we believe Aaron. Aaron refused an autopsy. He refused to let the truck be forensically analyzed. He then sold the truck. And basically now he's on the run. No one really knows where he is. However, Grace Christian Church and the political higher ups in Tennessee, they are protecting Aaron. They won't arrest him. They won't prosecute him. Despite Gracie going on YouTube and giving a very detailed account of her assault, the statute of limitations on her sexual assault is up this August of 2023. And it's believed that the authorities in Tennessee are just going to let that roll on by. So Gracie won't get justice. We can't let that happen. There's no statute of limitations on murder, however. These people can help open an investigation. We need Grant and Gracie's story to go viral. 
because they're letting a man get away with sexual assault and murder. That cannot happen. This is the case of Dylan Lenz. He met a girl on Snapchat and then stabbed her and ran her over twice with his car in a Walmart parking lot. Dylan and Abby met on October 15th of this year. They met on Snapchat and decided to meet up, so Abby sent Dylan her address and he went to her house to go pick her up. Their first stop was Walmart, so they walked around and got back in Dylan's car and they were getting ready to head to another store. Well, this is when Dylan grabbed Abby by the throat and then stabbed her in the shoulder multiple times. Then, with him being in a panic, he unlocked the car doors and let Abby get out of the car and she started running and screaming for help. Then Dylan freaked out even more, now being worried that he was going to get in trouble for an attempted murder, so he took his car and started chasing her. While Abby was running away, she was trying to run downhill and she tripped, and this is when Dylan ran her over with his car twice. A 911 call was made by a witness and they saw a car that was making bouncing motions and squealing their tires. On the floor, it appeared to be something that looked like a human body. The police rushed over there, but not before Dylan fled. He saw a car that was coming in his direction, and he got scared and drove off. When they got there, they saw that Abby had life-threatening injuries, so they rushed her to the hospital, and she was later airlifted to UW's Children's Hospital in Wisconsin. The next day, they went to go talk to Abby, and they saw that she had a spinal injury where she had no movement below her waist, both of her ankles were broken, and she had road rash from her shoulders down to her feet on top of other injuries. She is still in the ICU, and I'm going to leave a link to the GoFundMe in the comments. Since Dylan fled the scene, they had a look at the surveillance footage from Walmart, and they were able to get the license plate number, which was linked to Dylan, so they went over to his residence. When they got there, they saw that there was blood on Dylan's car, there was grass jammed into the car frame, and that there was a broken license plate where the rest of it was found at the crime scene. They also found blood on the inside of the car, which Dylan's mom said was from the victim. Dylan was immediately arrested and admitted that it was premeditated and said, quote, While I was in the store, I was like, this is the last day she's going to be alive. This is the last night of her life. I was out of control. I wasn't thinking. My body just took over. After the ordeal, he also texted his friend saying, oh no, I'm in big trouble. I really messed up this time. I did something really bad and I'm going away for a long time for this. He also said during questioning that if he didn't flee, he was going to put her body in a trash bag and throw it away, or he would bury it. After two weeks in jail, a $150,000 bond was posted and he made bail. Contingent upon his bail, he was told that he was not able to contact Abby or her family, either directly or indirectly. He was also told that he had to stay at home with the exception of going to school, work, court hearings, or doctor's appointments. Since his release, he entered a treatment program that was suggested by his doctors, and he is not going to school or work. Dylan is being charged with first-degree attempted homicide, and his maximum time in jail would be 60 years. His preliminary hearing is November 17th. Breaking news, a jury just reached a verdict in the Letitia Stauk murder trial. On January 27, 2020, Letitia reported her 11-year-old stepson, Gannon, missing. Gannon's father had been deployed by the National Guard the day prior. Letitia claimed that Gannon left the house to visit a friend down the street, but she couldn't provide names of those friends. Investigators interviewed Letitia several times because she was the last person to see Gannon alive, and each time her story changed drastically. One time she claimed that she was R-worded and that man had abducted Gannon. Another story was that Gannon had crashed his bike and then that man and abducted him. Hundreds of volunteers searched for Gannon in Colorado Springs, and two weeks after he vanished, particle board with Gannon's blood was found in a rural area nearby. Over the course of a month, Letitia's behavior became even more strange. She obtained a rental car, disconnected her phone, and left the state of Colorado. Investigators then conducted a more thorough search of Gannon's home, and this is a quote from Letitia's arrest warrant. Physical evidence recovered from the residence and inside Gannon's bedroom supports that a violent event occurred in his bedroom, which caused bloodshed, including blood splatter on the walls and enough blood loss to stain the mattress, soak through the carpet, carpet pad, and stain the concrete below his bed. Police learned that on the Monday Gannon went missing, he had stayed home from school. Letitia told the school that Gannon was ill. She also lied to her employer so that she could stay home as well. She told her boss that her stepfather had been fatally struck by a car, so she couldn't go into work that day. Letitia also sent her daughter to pick up carpet cleaner, trash bags, and baking soda, which she used to clean up the crime scene. Letitia searched for jobs in other states and apartments in Florida, both before and after Gannon went missing. These are some of her Google searches during that time, which included, I'm overdoing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help, and find me a rich guy who wants me to take care of his kids, as well as my son burned the carpet, how do I fix it? She also searched, one day some people will wish they treated you differently. Based on all this information and more, police believe that Letitia murdered her stepson Gannon and hid his remains hoping they would never be recovered. On March 2nd, 2020, Letitia was arrested in South Carolina. 
He was charged with murder in the first degree of a child under 12, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with a deceased human body, and tampering with physical evidence. And while she was being transported back to Colorado, she ended up getting out of her restraints and assaulting a deputy. She also apparently tried to grab one of their guns. Two weeks later, on March 17th, a man was doing a routine bridge inspection in Pensacola, Florida. Below the bridge, he found a heavy suitcase. He opened it and noticed a strong smell and then saw, quote, two little feet with football socks. DNA testing confirmed it was the body of 11-year-old Gannon Stauk. Gannon had suffered 18 sharp force injuries, four blunt force injuries, and one bullet wound. Hydrocodone was found in his system. Records show that Letitia rented a van and stayed just three miles away from where Gannon's body was found. Letitia has been on trial for the past five weeks. She's pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Her defense claims that she had a psychotic break and this resulted in Gannon's murder, while prosecutors argued that Letitia's brutal attack stemmed from her hatred of Gannon. After seven hours of deliberation, a jury found her guilty on all charges. So I used to believe that Peter Scully was the worst pedophile of all time, but I forgot about one man that definitely could have that title as well. I really need to warn everybody watching this TikTok that this is truly, I think, the most disturbing case I've ever read about, so if you're squeamish or you don't like this sort of stuff, please keep scrolling. This is about to get really dark. This is Ian Watkins, born July 30th, 1977, and the former lead singer of the band Lost Prophets. So if you don't know, Lost Prophets was a huge rock band from Wales in the United Kingdom. They were pretty famous, and a lot of people knew their name back in the day. They played huge sellout shows. The 2004 album, Start Something by Lost Prophets, ended up being a huge commercial success. Ian Watkins, the focus of our story today, was the lead singer for the band. But although the band was huge and world famous, there was a very, very dark cloud on the horizon. All this starts in the year 2008, when some allegations were brought forth. Apparently, crew members, band members, a lot of different people had seen Ian Watkins, the singer of the band, backstage with a number of fans that appeared to be very underage. At around the same time that people were seeing Ian backstage with kids, he was also going through a heavy drug addiction. And this drug abuse was often a cover that he used to isolate himself from the other band members. For example, on most of the shows they played, he would request his own dressing room away from the rest of the band. And it was in his own private dressing room where a lot of this child essay apparently took place. So from the years 2008 to 2011, six different people filed reports about Ian Watkins having inappropriate relationships with children. An ex-girlfriend of his even claimed that he showed her CP on his phone and she was deeply disturbed. But the police did nothing. In the year 2010, a woman came forward to the authorities and claimed that Ian had abused her young child. But once again, the authorities did not investigate the matter any further. And in the year 2009, Ian's ex-girlfriend was actually told by Ian himself that he was abusing a two-year-old child while recording an album in Los Angeles. Obviously, she was deeply disturbed by this. She went to the child's parents, told them about what was happening, went to the authorities. The child's parents even went to authorities too. But they didn't do anything. They didn't investigate any of these claims. Nothing ever happened. And during this period of his life when the band Lost Profits was huge, Ian was regularly participating in charity events where children were involved. He was making hospital trips to go visit sick kids. And that alone is deeply concerning because it was during that same time period when people were reporting him to the authorities for abusing children. But that leads us to the year 2012. During that year, Ian Watkins was arrested three different times for possessing drugs and drug paraphernalia. Apparently, some of his friends had ratted on him and went to authorities claiming that he was smuggling drugs from America to England. But it was eventually when the authorities searched his home when this case was blown wide open and when... Everything just takes such an extremely dark turn. I'm about to post a part two here, but you can't unhear some of the things we're going to discuss, so watch the next part with extreme caution. This CCTV footage shows this woman's last moments before she was brutally murdered by this man, only moments later. Hi, I'm Meg. I talk about true crime. Let's get into this case. Grace Mullane was only 22, and she had just graduated from the University of Lincoln. She was really excited about what was next to come. She had spent years saving up for a backpacking trip and it was finally time for her to go. First, she went to South America for around six weeks. And according to her family, she was bombarding them with updates and pictures. She was a family girl. In November of 2018, she arrived in New Zealand. She was doing the whole solo travel thing, so she was on her own. Over a week later, she made her way to Auckland where she checked into a hostel. Overall, she seemed to have been having a great time. December 1st, 2018, only a day before her birthday, 
She leaves the hostel at 6 p.m. to meet up with a guy from Tinder. This Tinder date's name was Jesse and he was 26 years old. You can see the meeting here in the CCTV footage and heading over to a restaurant slash bar. Grace was being safe and she was texting her friend during the entire day, telling her that they were really compatible and that was going well. Jesse was apparently living in a hotel at the time and around 9.30 they decided to head there. And these are Grace is last moments seen alive. The footage that comes after this is insane. December 2nd, aka the next day, was Grace's birthday, so her loved ones from England just started sending her loads of texts. Happy birthday, they were trying to call her. She wasn't responding, which was extremely out of character for her. Now, let me show you what Jessie was doing on the 2nd of December. Here's Jessie leaving the hotel. Here's Jessie up in that corner, buying a suitcase, returning it to the hotel, buying cleaning supplies, and lifting these suitcases back into the elevator and into a rental car that he bought that day. That same day, he even bought carpet cleaner, like a whole machine that cleans carpets, and told the hotel it was because he spilled some red wine on the floor. Safe to say he's looking a bit suspicious. By December 5th, Grace's family had not heard back from her yet. At this point, they had a really bad feeling, and so they called the Auckland police to let them know that she was missing. So they filed the missing persons report, and the Auckland police started digging. The police did an amazing job in this case. Go to part two to see what happened next because it's insane. <laughs> 